Okay, guys, uh, welcome to class. Uh, sorry, I don't get to see you in person, but I uh, just wanted to start off again with uh, on the stream here. This is the uh, the last two assignments that you have that you need to get done for this week. So you can see that for the week, there were one, two, three, four, five assignments that uh, need to get done. Okay. Um, the one, uh, the Ed puzzle, uh, I extended the deadline until... Um, Till to the end of the day today. Um, most of you have gotten that in. Hopefully, uh, that was helpful in kind of giving you some information that we're going to talk about today. Okay. Uh, know that you can go back and look at the other things you were supposed to have done by now, um, but get done as much as you possibly can, please. Okay. Um, so, what you need to do is come to today's date, so under classwork, and come to the in person uh, video. Uh, I will have the video in here after I make this video. But there's four things in here as of right now. Um, I'm going to go through this slideshow. You are going to need this right here, the Big Bang Notes, the fill in the blank. That's what you're going to turn in to me today. Uh, we will go through all the answers. So you'll have this done and you just have to submit it. And then eventually you're going to use this to do your digital portfolio, um, which won't be due until Wednesday. Uh, and I've changed the date on that as well. So part two of your digital portfolio where you're doing evidence for the Big Bang um, will be due on Wednesday. And we'll talk about that in class uh, next week. These are the notes. So if you get lost in any point where I'm going through, these are the notes. So you could take the information directly from here to fill in this and get it done. And then please make sure you get done your um, exit ticket. And that is right here. And I'm going to show you where it is in the uh, as we go through anyway. OK, um, so this is that fill in the blank note. So you should have this up right now. And I'm going to provide all the answers to it. Um, you can see as I scroll through, um, there's really not a whole lot to it. So there are three pieces of evidence that we're going to talk about today. OK, so as I come over here, I do want to. Um, Kind of go over a little bit from last class. So here's our, our in-person day. Um, and the things that we're going to talk about today or the reason we're going to go over today is to kind of get to evidence. So how do we know what we know? And so I gave you guys the peanut butter and jelly CER as a way of kind of starting that process of knowing how to find evidence. And so I highlighted some pieces of evidence here that I'll go over in a second. But I do want you to kind of think about today is how do we know? So we talked about all the things we know. Now today is about how do we know that? And so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. But uh, next class, we're going to do a, a, a lab that will hopefully help it make a little bit more sense as we go. So um, I'm going to come over here and talk about this really quickly. So this was the part where, you know, Mark comes home and he makes a sandwich and his brother Joey is sitting at the table and um, there's a baby at the table and the mom is feeding him applesauce and then the dad is coming home from work. And so the question is, who took the bite of the sandwich? And I highlighted some things in here from the text that I'm going to go over, but there are a, a number of possibilities. The baby took a bite, mom took a bite, dad took a bite, Joey took a bite or Mark took a bite and forgot that he took a bite and I don't know what happened there. So, but those are your possible things. So who does the evidence actually point to? So a couple things. So the baby was eating applesauce in the high chair. So if the baby's in the high chair, most likely the baby is unable to get out of the high chair, but that would be a reasoning thing. Um, but the evidence would be that the baby is in a high chair eating applesauce, okay? Um, and then one other suggestion from that, you might say, well, He's eating applesauce, maybe he doesn't have teeth yet or um, things like that. But so for right now, the baby is in a high chair. Um, dad uh, just got home from work and he has grease on his hands or oil on his hands from work. OK, so that is a piece of evidence as well. Uh, Joey had some crumbs on the front of his shirt. That's pretty strong evidence, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, and then the other thing is that there was a small bite had been taken out of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. OK, so those are your pieces of evidence, just facts from the text. The reasoning piece would be like, well, the baby couldn't have done it because the baby was in the high chair and couldn't get out of the high chair. OK, that would be a, a piece of reasoning. Mom didn't do it because mom was in the other room and called you into the other room. So since mom wasn't in the room to do it, then mom couldn't have done it. That's reasoning. 
Dad didn't do it because dad had grease on his hands. And if he had taken a bite of the sandwich, he would have left grease on the sandwich. Or dad has a much bigger mouth than the, the um, size of the bite taken from the sandwich, something like that. Joey, Joey's harder to, to exclude. Joey's got crumbs on his shirt. So I would use that as evidence to say the evidence points to Joey. Um, Joey's got crumbs on his shirt. Jo Joey's a younger kid, so he has a smaller mouth. So he'd take a smaller bite. Um, Joey just doesn't uh, strike me as somebody I can trust. Um, and then Mark, it's unlikely that he took a bite of his sandwich and forgot that he took a bite of his sandwich. So the evidence points to Joey. Um, and the reasoning pieces are mainly that he has crumbs on his shirt, which he would have gotten when he took the bite. Um, at first we were saying, oh, maybe he had peanut butter on his mouth, but um, we took that out and make it too obvious. But um, so hopefully that's a, an easy way of getting an idea of how to do a claim evidence reasoning writing thing. OK, um, as we move forward, I, I want to get to the evidence for the Big Bang. And so. One thing that we didn't touch upon last class was light. And light is the reason we know everything we know about the universe. Light is extremely important. But light occupies more than what we traditionally just think of as light. When we talk about light, so looking at this diagram here, light that we think of it normally as visible light is a small part of a much bigger spectrum of light. So this is called the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, electromagnetic radiation is light and visible light, what we think of red, orange, yellow, green, green, blue, and violet is just a small, small part of that. There's also radio waves, infrared, microwave, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma rays. And so the only thing that changes from one type of light to another is the wavelength, which affects the amount of energy. Longer waves have less energy and shorter waves have more energy. And so they transition from one to another, just like the colors transition from one to another, okay? So just quick little uh, background on light. So we use every kind of light for different things. Radio waves we use for things like communication, for our cell phones and things like that. Um, infrared we use for night vision mainly, but also in your remote control and things like that. Um, ultraviolet is, uh, so when you go out in the sun and you get a sunburn, or I get a sunburn, most people tan, um, that is one use for ultraviolet light, black lights and things like that. You know, CSI uses it to find blood spatter and things like that. Um, X-rays are used to see bones, so they are so short wave and high energy, they go right through your skin, but they don't go through bones, so they leave a... Uh, 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 an outline, if you will, of what your bones look like. And then gamma rays are your highest energy. And those traditionally are just found in space, but they, we also use them for certain things and nuclear testing and things like that on earth. Okay. Um, no, in this presentation, there is a lot more in here than what I'm going to go over. Uh, and, and I just know that my internet is not good enough to uh, record and play this video. Uh, but you just, you already watched the Ed Puzzle video, hopefully, and got some of the evidence out of that. This video, please watch on your own. It's only like a five minute video, but it gives the three pieces of evidence for the Big Bang that I'm going to talk about in this right now. Okay. So that is a pretty important thing right there. Um, I'm also not going to show this video on uh, spectroscopy that talks about like the colors that are given off by different elements, but spectroscopy can be used to determine what elements are in stars, the temperature of stars, and if the stars are moving and how fast and in what direction they're moving. So we get a lot from spectroscopy. And so a little background on that. Um, so this right here, this rainbow of colors, this is called the continuous spectrum. So when light from the sun shines through water droplets in the air, it gets refracted or bent into the colors of the rainbow. And we see that as red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Elements, it turns out that if we vaporize them or excite them in an electrical field, they give off only certain colors. And we're going to do this in class. And so we'll see that different elements give off different colors of light. And these are called emission spectrum or a bright line spectrum because it's just a series of bright lines superimposed on a black background. So you'll notice, though, that the colors line up with the colors from 
uh, a continuous spectrum. So the purple or violet is on one side and the yellows and the reds are on the other side. And it's always in the same pattern. Each element has a different fingerprint, if you will. So just like if a person commits a crime, we can use their fingerprint to determine if they're the ones that committed that crime. We can use the fingerprint of the elements to determine what is in a star. And I'll show you how in just a moment, okay? Um, so then there are three types of spectra. Continuous spectrum, which is a rainbow. Emission spectrum, which is what I just went over. The elements give off these bright lines. And then an absorption spectrum. An absorption spectrum is given off by stars. So the stars give off this kind of spectrum. And you'll notice that this red line here from an emission spectrum, it matches up with a missing line here. And this, I don't know what color that is, but it matches up right here. And same goes with for these other lines. So it turns out that because stars give off this kind of spectrum, and we can compare that spectrum with elements, we can actually figure out what elements are present in a star. And I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that in just a second. So um, how do we know what stars are made of? So this is something that I don't know if we'll do it yet or not, but I created this um, as a way of kind of showing students how we can use the absorption spectrum of stars and the emission spectrum of elements to determine what is in uh, the star. So to give you an example, um, okay, so if I look at this star right here, um, I see that it's got these dark lines in it. And one of the things you're gonna see later on today is that all stars contain hydrogen, okay? So if I have the emission spectrum from hydrogen and I pull it up, to underneath the star, hopefully you can see that all the bright lines from hydrogen are missing from the star, okay? So I know that this star contains hydrogen because all of these lines are missing from the star. If I look though, I see these other lines. Now, those lines are caused by a different element, not by hydrogen. So hydrogen, all the lines from hydrogen are missing, but these other three lines, they're caused by some other element. And I can say, well, maybe it's caused by car from carbon. So I'm going to pull carbon up here. And I look and say, mm, well, it's not caused by carbon. And in fact, these lines, they're not missing. So this star does not contain carbon. And I can continue like that and then say calcium and keep going. And it doesn't contain calcium. And I can continue in that way to see exactly what is in the star. Okay. Um, coming back over here. So now I'm going to go over the notes with you really quickly, and then I'll come back to that and, and show you one other thing with that. So um, again, the, the notes that you want, you want to have this right here open so you can fill in the blank. And I am going to go over the notes. If I click on it, uh, these are the notes right here. And you, you can feel free to click on them as, as you want. Okay. So the three things that we're going to go over today, the three pieces of evidence for the Big Bang are that most stars are redshifted, and we're going to talk about the Doppler effect and how that relates to redshift. We're going to look at the ratio of the elements in the universe, which is mostly hydrogen and helium, and then we're going to talk about the cosmic background radiation. So these are our three pieces of evidence for the Big Bang, okay? So I, I told you my internet's not working great right now. There are a couple videos here. This is just a funny one from the big, the TV show, The Big Bang Theory, uh, where Sheldon dressed up as the Doppler effect. But this video goes over how the Doppler effect works. But again, my internet is just too slow to, to record and show it to you. So know that that's available to you. Um, when I click on the Doppler effect, so the Doppler effect works for any kind of wave. And so sound waves is what we typically associate it with. And then uh, light waves are also a wave, and so they're affected as well. So the Doppler effect, typically we hear like a, a, an ambulance or a police car going by with their siren. And as they go by, we hear the, the sound, the, the volume of it change. As they get closer, we hear it louder. But not only that, we hear a change in the pitch. And it's important to understand that that change in pitch is caused because the police car or the ambulance is moving. And as it moves towards us, the, the sound waves get compressed. 
And then as it moves away from us, the sound waves get elongated. And so that change in the sound wave, we hear as a higher pitch or a lower pitch. And so as an ambulance goes by, usually we hear and it goes like that. Or if you go to like a, a race car, uh, like a racetrack, like Vandermeer, and you hear the cars coming and then going, the pitch that you hear changes. And again, that is called the Doppler effect. Okay. There's a nice visual of it right here that like, so if you invent, imagine like dropping a rock in the water, the, the ripples would move out in all directions equally. But if that rock were moving, the waves would get compressed in one direction and elongated in another direction. And so this object here is moving to the right here in this direction. And because it's moving in this way, the waves get kind of compressed over here and they get elongated over here. Now with sound, that's a high pitch and a low pitch, but with light, we don't hear light, we see light. And so the difference we see with light is the change in color. So this would be a bluer looking light and this would be a redder looking light. So then we come over here, and so this is where you're going to start really to fill in um, your note sheet. So there are uh, three options. We have that the universe is stagnant. It's not moving. And so what we would see if the universe were standing still is that the waves from light wouldn't be changed in any way. Uh, the wavelength of light would be the same as it's traveling from the galaxy or star to the Earth. OK, so the starlight would not be stretched or compressed. It would just stay the way it is. OK, but if the galaxy is getting bigger or the universe, sorry, if the universe is getting bigger, then galaxies would be moving away from us. And if they're moving away from us, the light would get stretched. And if the light is begun, so I'll click on this. Sorry, if the light is getting stretched. All right, so the expanding universe, the, the universe is getting bigger, the distance between the two points is getting larger, then the starlight gets stretched out. And if it's getting stretched out, we're going to call that a red shift. And we call it a red shift because red is a longer wavelength of light. Blue is a shorter wavelength of light. So red shifted if the universe is getting bigger, and then blue shifted if it is getting smaller. So in part C here, the universe is getting smaller. It's collapsing on itself. And so this is what we would see if that were what's happening. So if the universe were collapsing, the starlight, the waves of light would get compressed. And we would call that a blue shift, a shift towards the blue end of the spectrum, because blue is a shorter wavelength. Now, really, violet is the shortest wavelength of visible light. I don't know why we don't say violet shift, but we don't. Okay. So then blue shift again is if the light is being co compacted or compressed, and that would uh, mean a collapsing um, universe. So it turns out most of what we uh, see when we look out is a red shifted universe. There are some stars and some galaxies that are blue shifted, but they are the vast minority um, and most of what we see is red shifted. Okay. So then part two of evidence, the, the ratio of element elements that make up the universe. And so the first two elements that formed were hydrogen and helium, and they make up the vast majority of our universe. About 74% of our universe is hydrogen and 25% uh, is helium. So a huge majority, 99% of our universe is made up of hydrogen and helium. And so that, that's kind of shown here. And so again, on your, your sheet, it asks you to fill in the percentages. So, and you won't be responsible for the actual numbers, but you're gonna use this information in your digital portfolio. Uh, so 74% hydrogen, about 25% helium, and then about 1% everything else. So all the other elements that make up the earth and the sun and us uh, are that 1% right there.
Okay. Um, and then over here, it says in older distant stars, it matches what we'd expect to find if the entire universe were once a really big star. So when the universe first started, it was pure energy. And as it expanded out and cooled off, that energy diminished and it allowed for elements to start forming. Um, and those elements, when they first started to form, match what we would see if the universe were a really big star. Okay. And then coming over here, uh, just knowing that some of the first stars that ever formed are still around and they have a different composition from newer stars. And that's because these newer stars generally formed from the death of older stars. Like, so our sun formed when another star went supernova, exploded, and a part of that nebula that went shot out uh, actually collapsed down again and formed a new star. And so newer stars, younger stars, um, like our sun, um, have a different composition. We're much heavier in, in some of the metals that we find around us, okay? And then the third piece of evidence, the final piece of evidence is the cosmic background radiation. And this is a really kind of a cool one because again, it comes from a prediction. So if the universe started off as a single point and then expanded outward, it was believed that it would cool off as it expanded. And then you can kind of work out based on the size of the universe, well, how much would it cool off in that time as it's gotten bigger and bigger? And it was predicted that the temperature of the universe should be about 2.7 degrees Kelvin. And many years after this prediction was made, it was actually found. And so these two men were, were doing these experiments with, um, with radio waves and they kept on hearing this static. They had the most refined radio receiver that was ever made. And they kept, no matter where they pointed their antenna, they heard the same static. And that static turned out to be the background radiation of the Big Bang. And so the prediction was realized. And so that's kind of a cool thing that that prediction was actually discovered after the fact. Okay. And it's called the cosmic background radiation. And if you map it out, it looks clumpy, but this is false color image showing you just minor variations in the temperature of the universe. And those minor variations are where we got galaxies and things that have coalesced together. And so it's kind of a cool thing to see. Okay. Um, so as you fill in everywhere we look in space, there's a faint, and I hate this word layer, like it, there's a faint afterglow, if you will, of energy. And that afterglow of energy is nearly the same temperature in every direction. And one thing we'll find out as we move forward, that temperature and wavelength are very closely related. So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the temperature. So when we talk about blue stars being the hotter stars, that's because blue is a shorter wavelength. Red stars are colder stars because they have a longer wavelength. And we'll, we'll look at that as we get into class. Implying that it all came from the same event. So something must have created that energy. So our best explanation is that it was the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. Okay. Um, and then I'm just going to race through this because it's just more information talking about that evidence of the Big Bang. And so, again, the same kind of a picture. And again, about 13.7, 13.8 billion years ago is when this happened. OK, um, and that's what all of this shows. And so that's really the end of the notes. Um, so I'm going to come back over here and just show you one more very interesting thing. Um, at least interesting to me. I hope it's interesting to you. So how do we know that stars are moving? So I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to come to the third star that I have on here. And it might take a minute because my internet is slow. Uh, but so here is star three. Um, and if I look at star three, and I, I told you earlier that all stars contain hydrogen. But if I pull hydrogen up over here, doesn't look like this star has hydrogen. These lines here aren't missing here. Like none of these lines. This one's close, but it doesn't line up. But I'm telling you, all stars contain hydrogen. So one thing I can do is I can take this hydrogen and I can kind of move it around. And then I say, oh, if I go to right there, that one lines up, that one lines up, these two line up, 
this one lines up. It's not perfect because I didn't make this perfect, but I'm going to try to move it a little bit better. Let's see. Right about there. Um, and so now it does line up. And so basically what I want you to see is that the lines are shifted and they're shifted to the right over here. OK, so if I mark that and realize that these hydrogen lines are shifted from where they normally would be, you'll notice that I moved it towards the red end of the spectrum. So when we say a star is red shifted, it doesn't mean the light from the star is red. It means that these absorption lines are shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. So now if I kind of come and I say, well, does it contain helium? I wouldn't put helium here. If the star is moving, all the lines should be shifted. So I move the helium over to exactly where I did the hydrogen. And I can see, oh, wait, yeah, those lines are all missing as well. So this star contains helium as well. And then I say, well, does it contain calcium? And I move it to the same point. And if I look, well, that one's no. So it doesn't contain calcium. So I can go through like that, OK? Um, and then going through here, so just a quick recap, the three pieces of evidence for the Big Bang are this idea of redshift that most of what we look out at and see is redshifted. A very few things are blue shifted, but almost everything is redshifted. The majority of the elements that we see out there are hydrogen and helium, as we would expect if they were formed in a big, hot universe to begin with. And then this idea of the cosmic background radiation, this cooler microwave radiation that exists, that is the afterglow of the Big Bang. Okay. Um, so that is what you will end up putting into your digital portfolio. I, I've extended this until Wednesday because I don't want to give you too much after this crazy week that we've had. And I apologize for this week. Um, I, I hate that you guys are being exposed to this, but Hopefully I've gone through this quickly and you won't waste too much time today. And I just hope it works out for you. But the one thing you need to do today is please make sure that you fill in your exit ticket so you get credit for being in class today. OK, so I know I went through that quickly. Uh, the only thing you have to turn in today is the exit ticket and then your filled in notes that I just went through with you. And that's all you have to get done today. And then we'll do a, a lab activity uh, in class on Monday and Tuesday. So I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I look forward to seeing you guys on Monday or Tuesday. Have a great one.